Greetings and salutations, friends. Now, welcome back to more Warhammer Fantasy Lore. Since we've been talking about, about magic recently, I figured we'd stay somewhat on the topic, but sidestep it a little bit onto something else that I haven't covered that much, and yet has a lot of really interesting lore that I do need to start examining a bit closer. Namely, the Tomb Kings, and more precisely today, the Lich Priests. The reason why there are Tomb Kings in the first place, and the magic that makes it all possible. For the Tomb Kings, of course, are very different to the regular, quote-unquote, regular, undead of the old world, in that the Tomb Kings and their priests possess all of the intelligence, all of the agency and the memories of their previous lives, making them living spirits clad in undead flesh, rather than the mere marionettes that are the undead puppets of the more usual undead sort. But how did this distinction appear? What was the idea behind having sentient undead in the first place? Where did it all come from, and how did they achieve it? Well, to answer that question, we have to go way, 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 way back in time. Thousands of years before the rise of the human empire of the old world. To the first, and perhaps the mightiest of all human empires, Nehekara. This vast and powerful empire, located in the southern reaches of the Old World, was a collection of city-states, each ruled over by a local monarch, but all bound together under the overarching rulership of a single leader, situated in the nation's capital of Khemri. This had not always been so, the various city-states had enjoyed de facto independence until they had been brought in line by the mightiest of all the kings, one Setra. He had brought all the other city-states in line and formed Nehekara. But unfortunately for Setra, despite all of his great achievements, despite his immeasurable wealth and innumerable armies, he was still but a mere man. And that was not good enough for Setra. <laughs> the only thing more famous than Setra's achievements was his legendary greed. He wished for immortality. He wanted to continue to rule the lands that he had conquered for all eternity, and in order to do so, he founded the Mortuary Cult. A kind of uh, scientific institute to try and figure out how to defeat death itself. <laughs> wow, that's uh, uh, that, that's quite the ask. <laughs> the sheer balls on this guy. You know, imagine that being summoned to a meeting. You know, the head magicians and the priests of Nehekaran society all being gathered up in one room to meet your feared legendary leader. And he basically starts the meeting by saying, "So, I don't want to die, ever. Fix it." <laughs> and off you go. Ay ay ay. Where to begin? That was probably the question on everyone's lips after that particular meeting. But, seeing as if they failed, they would all be executed, <laughs> it's not like they had much in the way of a choice. And, to be fair, the sorcerers and the priests of ancient Nehekara were pretty damn good at their jobs, and they managed to extend the reign of Setra far beyond the usual realms of time for a human man. Especially considering the age in which he lived, this wasn't exactly 21st century society. Most people would probably be lucky to live past their 40s, and yet Setra trucked on for a hundred years plus. But true immortality was, sadly, beyond his grasp. The mortuary cults, despite making considerable progress, could not prevent the king's death. But the priests had one final gambit up their sleeves, uh, one they launched as much, I think, to avoid the inevitable punishment of failure as anything else. They informed Cetera that whilst they could not prevent his passing, they could bring him back. 
Once their rituals had been perfected and their magic honed to a greater degree, they would resurrect him as a de facto demigod to rule over a perfect golden future for all eternity. They promised him not only immortality, but utopia. Still wasn't quite good enough for Cetra, mind you, as he still died cursing the mortuary cult, but vitally, he did not have them all killed before his passing. Which I suppose was a form of indirect endorsement. He had constructed before his death a massive pyramid which would be filled with all of his treasures, all of his loyal servants, and his legions of warriors. Those fortunate enough to be resurrected alongside him when the promised future arrived. And so rose the next king to power and he was given the exact same assurances as Cetra, for the mortuary cult had still not unlocked the secrets of immortality, but they were making astounding progress. After a mere five generations of mortuary priests, bearing in mind that each generation lived significantly longer than the first, so this wasn't a question of, say, a few hundred years, it was probably a question of a thousand plus, they eventually arrived at the generation of priests that simply just didn't die. Their flesh would rot, their skin would become dry parchment, and their eyes would become little more than hollowed out sockets, but they wouldn't die. And whilst this form of immortality wasn't good enough for the kings, they wished to reign over a golden utopia after all as beautiful, near-perfect divine beings, it did bring reassurances. It made the kings believe that maybe, just maybe, the priests could actually deliver on their promises. After all, if they had all eternity to work with, Surely they'd come up with a solution eventually, right? And this, unsurprisingly, made the priests of the mortuary cult the second most important individuals in all of Nehekaran society. Only the royals were of higher standing than the priests. And the members of the mortuary cult were the only ones in Nehekaran society that could not simply be outright executed at the merest whim and say so of one of the royal family members. Which may not sound like much of a privilege, but bearing in mind, if you indeed live in a society where anyone can be for any reason at any time simply just killed, on the say-so of some royal brats, being the only people in that society immune to that power, that's still a fair bit of a privilege. And of course, the mortuary cult also wielded a great deal of political influence, because at the end of the day, they were the ones responsible for bringing the kings back from death. And so even the kings didn't really want to get on their bad side, because after all, who knows? In a hundred years time, long after your passing, perhaps they figure out how to bring everyone back and accidentally, whoops, they just forgot about you. How very, very unfortunate. Yeah, probably uh, best to stroke this particular hairless, rotted, magical kitty cat with the fur. And with the cult's growing power and influence, of course, came hierarchy. <laughs> because of course. Within any organization that gains a degree of power, you're gonna find that those at the top will want to remain at the top. And in this case, the best way to do so was to ensure that the deeper, darker secrets of the mortuary cult were reserved only for those of the uppermost echelons. And it was starting to become quite the treasure trove of knowledge as well. Whilst they had yet to perfect the art of bringing someone back from the dead, they had made considerable strides. First and foremost, of course, in their own forms that no longer perished. They could, of course, be destroyed, and if they were, their souls would be lost forever, and their uh, 
physical exterior was less than aesthetically pleasing as the skin started to drop off their bones, but their intellects remained as sharp as ever. Their spirits remained intact, and that was an important first step in immortality. To perfect this yet further, they began by increasing their knowledge about the embalming process, because the aesthetics were important. If they were to bring the kings back from the dead, they would have to be preserved as much as possible. This process was in many ways similar to our world's version of embalming, although with a magical twist to it. Runes, scriptures, and magical spells were carved into the bones of the corpse and also inscribed into their sacred vestments. These would then later on act as foci for the magical energies that would eventually resurrect and reinvigorate, rejuvenate, and restore the body to perfection. Or at least, that was the theory. The magic in and of itself was complex and understood only in its most rudimentary of elements. The lich priests were of the opinion that what they were doing was harnessing the breath of the gods. What the colleges of magic would refer to as the winds of magic, the lich priests believed to be the essence of their deities, and by harnessing them correctly, they could theoretically breathe new life into a corpse. No matter how withered or desiccated, it could theoretically be restored to its once ideal form, and perhaps possibly even improved upon. As of yet, they had been unable to actually do this, but they had been able to resurrect the long dead. And this was important because currently, all they had done was prevent death from taking someone in the first place. The next step, of course, then, was a resurrection. Unfortunately, however, what they resurrected were not the actual people in question. When they brought back a body, they brought back nothing more than an undead puppet. A lifeless, soulless husk directed via the magical energies of the lich priest who had resurrected them. This obviously was not good enough for the Tomb Kings. They wished to be resurrected not only with their mental faculties and aesthetic forms, uh, they were certainly not going to be very happy at all if the Lich Priest started reanimating them as mindless puppets. If there was anything likely to break the power of the Mortuary Cult, it was rumours of that kind of nonsense getting out. And so the Lich Priest, understanding that there was very little to be gained from this, and everything to lose, decided that no. We're going to carry out these experiments on the lesser servants of the Tomb Kings. Lower levels of embalming techniques were carried out on the Tomb King's favoured servants, on their warriors and their favoured concubines. For, of course, what is an eternal afterlife without a little bit of company, eh? These would then be resurrected along with the king, but in a more limited form. They might be eternal servants, for example, and in that case, it didn't matter if they were just bones, they could still serve, and those who were more favoured would be given limited levels of embalming, allowing them to be resurrected in a still pleasing enough form, but not to the standards of the Tomb Kings, obviously, you know. You gotta have standards in society to make it clear who was the real ruler here, of course. This experimentation also led them to work on non-human subjects. One of the big things in Nehekaran society were chariots. War chariots in particular was the premier weapon of war at the time, and having a nice chariot was also a status symbol. And so the Tomb Kings would of course want to be resurrected with their favoured chariots and, of course, their favoured steeds as well. And so the Lich Priests would have to reanimate horse skeletons too. Luckily, the theory behind it wasn't all that much different, but this made them think, what else could we possibly reanimate? 
and they began working on the reanimation of statues and the binding of spirits into non-human shapes and forms, creating the vast carrion constructs and huge war statues. This was not to actually be used for any real war purpose, however, until much, much later, but undoubtedly the Lich Priests were experimenting with these things even at a relatively early stage. This all developed into as much a religion as a science. The Lich Priests realized that the binding of the Breath of the Gods was a highly precise art, and even the slightest mistake, the tiniest miss pronunciation of a word could lead to the priest carrying out the ritual simply exploding, or spontaneously being set on fire, or other less than ideal outcomes. To help them combat these unfortunate side effects, they also developed a vast array of tools that would double both as ceremonial garb and symbols of office, ritualistic knives, staffs, and headdresses, all inscribed with magical runes that would aid the priest in channeling the breath of the gods. Additionally, the embalming process and the very tomb chambers of the kings would also be inscribed with runes and magical sigils, both to ward them from outside interference and also to make it far easier to resurrect the kings once the time finally came. It would also allow the Lich Priest to improve upon their magic. If they could create a magical formula that could bring back dead bones, alright. In that case, the next step would be to imbue those bones with a spirit, and that might be a second magical formula. And then the third one might be the resurrection of the human form, the regrowing of flesh. That might be a third formula. The recreation of eyes, a fourth, and so on and so on. If all of these spells had to be verbally chanted by the priests, every single spell, every single syllable, increased the risk of failure exponentially. If, however, they could all be bound into a magical item, de facto programmed into a staff of office, for example, then fantastic. That would take a great burden off the Lich Priests and allow them to constantly improve upon their spells, to craft ever greater and ever more complex series of enchantments. Their work became so all-consuming that the Lich Priests eventually took up residence within the great tombs of the kings. They had their own chambers within the vast pyramids, their own alcoves, their own labs, their own storage areas where both the treasures of the kings and of course their servants would be stored, as well as vast holding pens basically, where the servants of the king would be kept, their future legions of servants and warriors. It was all becoming quite codified and proper, really. It appeared as if the mortuary cults might actually be able to fulfill their promises after all. They were getting oh so, so, so very close, but as they say, when something seems too good to be true, it usually is. And on this particular occasion, the caveat, the turd in the sandwich, was one new member of the mortuary cult, a lad by the name of Nagash, first son of King Ketep of the Third Dynasty of Khemri. Since he was the first son, he was destined to be invested in the mortuary cult, whilst his younger brother, Tutep, would ascend to the throne of Khemri, and via it, the complete rulership of Nehekara. This, however, did not sit well with Nagash, who decided one day to change destiny a little bit. An accident of birth was not going to keep him from his deserved position. He slaughtered his brother's bodyguards and entombed the young Tuthep within their own father's massive pyramid. 
going the extra mile just to be cuntish, of course. You could have just stabbed him, slit his throat, bashed his brains in, you know, killed them quick, but no, no. Let hunger and starvation take him instead. Ah, uh, because, again, you gotta go that extra mile. And also, remember, within Nehekaran society, where if you were not embalmed, if you were not prepared for the afterlife, they would have viewed that as you essentially robbing them of their future. And Toming's Tuthep was so much more than just killing him. Nagash was a bit of a bastard, but he was a bastard with a lot of power. He was now not only the head of the mortuary cult, but also the king of Nehekara. Never before had so much martial power, so much authority, and so much knowledge been focused within one single individual. But to an extent, Nagash did kind of deserve it. He, after all, managed something that the priests had not. He succeeded where they had failed. He created the elixir of life, the key to everlasting immortality. Now, oh, yes, it had a few minor caveats here and there, like, for example, binding anyone who drank it inevitably to the will of Nagash, but hey, Details, details, and, to be fair, it was a superior version of the elixir that was to be created later in Lamia that would result in the modern-day vampires. And so Nagash's rule had been thoroughly cemented. Not only did he now have a cadre of immortal and extremely powerful lieutenants who literally could not betray him, he was also in possession of the power of the mortuary cults and of Nehekara. All that was left now was to cement his rule permanently. And he would do so via the construction of the Great Black Pyramid of Khemri. This vast edifice would be laced with all his vast knowledge to be a focal point of magical energies. It would concentrate the breath of the gods and enslave them to Nagasha's will. A plan so thoroughly steeped in hubris and ambition it could do not but succeed, surely. And to be honest, it kind of should have. Nagasha's undoing was the fact that despite being immortal, he was too impatient. He levied unbearable taxes upon all of his vassal kings. He demanded they tear down their own temples and tombs to provide building material to his own vast black pyramid. And those who balked at these ruinous taxes, those who dared protest against this clear abuse of royal privilege, he simply had them killed, their cities burned and ruined, and the material dragged off anyways. This is not how you get friends. And the other kings of Nehekara soon began murmuring and plotting against him. They began preparing to overthrow their tyrant ruler. But Nagash was not going to go quietly. Using his knowledge gained from the mortuary cult, he rose up legions of the dead, the very first time they had ever been used as a weapon of war in the entirety of the Warhammer world's long and storied history. And with his vast horde of the dead, he crushed the Nehekaran kings, one by one, city by city, state by state. But he refrained from the overwhelming display of force that he could have launched. At this point, with the kings of Nehekara unaware of the power he wielded and unaccustomed to fighting against the dead, Nagash had every advantage. Undoubtedly, he could have crushed the entirety of Nehekaran living society within a few years. Instead, he relented. He moved slowly, 
deliberately, making examples out of those who opposed him. Rather than crushing them all, he expected that soon the rest would see reason and bend the knee once more. Nagash was not yet at the point where he simply wanted to see the entire land ruled over by the undead. He still believed that there was a combination to be had, a happy middle of the road solution. This belief, however, was to be quashed at a massive battle at Khemri's own gates, where the armies of seven kings marched out to besiege the Black Pyramid, and alongside them strode the Mortuary Cult, who had also rebelled against Nagash's tyrannical rule, and of course the threat he posed to them as well. Nagash had not been a kind and gentle superior, that's just... Leave it at that. And this is where they first brought their constructs to war. They must undoubtedly have been experimenting this for quite some time to levy such a force, but they brought ginormous statues of long dead skeletal giants. They brought vast constructs of bone and wood imbued with the spirits of long lost heroes. They even reanimated the statues of the Ushabiti warriors lining Khemri's own pathway. And with this huge army, combining both the strength of undead constructs and the living, they assaulted Khemri, and in a titanic battle outside and beyond Khemri's walls, they crushed Nagash's undead legion, pushing all the way up until the Black Pyramid, where they hauled his remaining lieutenants out from under its protective shade and executed them all in the sunlight of day. But unfortunately for the people of Nehekara, Nagash himself escaped, and the kings did not do enough to pursue and put the traitor down for good. They would have to live with the spectre of his vengeance ever hanging over them, but what could he do? He was in exile now. He was exiled to the lands of the barbarians beyond the borders of Nehekara. He could not be any more threat to them. And so, everyday life continued for quite some time. Although, in a reduced capacity, the power of the kings had been severely weakened by the rise of Nagash. There was a great deal of mistrust, and many of the kings decided they were better off as independent city-states rather than tributaries to the larger nation of Nehekara. It would take many generations until the rise of al Qadizar the Conqueror before the kingdom was once again reforged and approached once more the zenith of their glory days. Just in time, too, for the return of Nagash. He had been biding his time and making his preparations, including the resurrection of Arkin the Black, his most trusted lieutenants from the First War, and when he descended upon Nehekara once again, it was at the head of a vast undead horde. Bent on establishing his dominance over the kingdom once more. But it was not to be. Al Karizar proved to be more than a match for Nagash or Arkan the Black. He outmatched, outmaneuvered, and outfought the undead armies until finally, after years of conflict, he smashed them irreparably at the Battle of the Golden Skull. After this, Nagash had to retreat once more, but this time he was not going to return to conquer the lands of Nehekara. He had decided that if the lands would not be his, he would deny them at the very least to his rival. Utilizing the power of the Black Pyramid, which no one had dared disassemble, something they were about to pay most dearly for, he gathered un imaginable quantities of dark power, the likes of which the world had never before seen, and unleashed them through the pyramid, forever staining the great river that flowed through Nehekara. Once a source of life, it now became a source of death, the great Mortis River, as it would become called. Diseases ravaged the lands of Nehekara. In Khemri, only one out of 
10 citizens survived the diseases. And across the lands, few of the city-states fared all that much better. And for every single person who died, the armies of Nagash grew by one. It soon became clear that there was to be no victory for the living this time. And the conqueror, al Qadisar himself, was captured and hauled off to Nagash's dungeons, where he was to be tortured for, presumably, eternity, knowing Nagash's cuntish streak. And it was very possible that the entire Warhammer world would have been drowned beneath the marching footsteps of the undead if it were not for the intervention of the true heroes of the story, the Skaven. Who decided that they didn't like the idea of undead legions trampling through Skaven Blight, and so they snuck into Al Qadisar's cell and gifted him a blade forged with warpstone, the Fell Blade. A weapon of such unimaginable destructive power that even just wielding it would slice away at the bearer's soul. A weapon which al Qadizar grabbed greedily and freed from his shackles was guided by the kind, gentle, furried creatures to where Nagash lay prostrate, attempting to recover from the vast magical energies he had unleashed. Al-Kharizar slew the necromancer, chopping his body into a thousand tiny pieces and tossing them into a furnace, just for good measure. And so, the world was saved. At least partially. This is where the Tomb Kings finally come into the picture. For you see, the vast magics unlinked by Nagash, whilst they had not penetrated past the wards and protective measures carved into the huge pyramids of the kings, they had broken some of them open. They had interfered with the wards. And slowly but surely, the dead kings began to stir. And they were horrified at the future that they awoke to. <laughs> this was no golden paradise. Outside was nothing but death, destruction, and fires. Broken pyramids and the scattered bones of thousands. Quite the far cry from the land of milk and honey they had been promised by their priests. And understandably disappointed, they were all a little bit angry at having been screwed so very, very thoroughly. And you also gotta remember, this is a collection of hundreds of people that in life were completely and utterly uncontested. They were at the absolute top of the pyramid once they were alive. Now they all emerge in the sunshine at once, with armies at their command. I think you can guess what the next phase in this was to be. Yes, yes indeed. Hundreds of tiny little reconquistors, as each and every king decided to try and reconquer his kingdom. A war on a near unimaginable scale, as tens of thousands of undead troopers marched out from innumerable tombs and pyramids and engaged one another in a completely uncontrolled, chaotic, free-for-all melee. It was chaos of the purest sort, and nobody seemed to be winning. Not like there was going to be any outside intervention either. Even if there were still human rulers alive in the lands of Nehekara, what little army they may have had left after years of war against Nagash would have been completely and utterly decimated by the magical plague that he unleashed. There was no stopping this apocalypse of the dead. And so the mortuary cult decided to intervene once more by awakening the only king that could bring order to everything else. As it began, so it ended with the reawakening of Setra, now known as the Imperishable. He had by far the largest army. His realm had been by far the richest, and when he marched out in the desert winds, he brought forth uncountable legions to dwarf those of any other king. Not to mention the loyalty of the mortuary cult. 
It didn't take long for Cetra to teach all of the other kings who Daddy really was. And those who didn't submit, he simply destroyed. And he made sure of, in fact, he made a point out of destroying them to the point where there was no resurrection. Not now, and not in some potential future paradise. And after having secured the lands once again, like he did once so long ago, he determined that the threat of Nagash was still paramount, and if it was not Nagash, then it would be outside invaders, greenskins, looters, and all manners of perfidious nonsense that had grown forth across the world since he had ruled. He ordered all of the Tomb Kings to be laid back to rest, using the knowledge of the Mortuary Cult. He would, however, remain awake and guard the borders of Nehekara along with the Mortuary Priests, who would resurrect Tomb Kings, Princes and Forces on his request, or on occasion, on the authority of local priesthoods, who would themselves determine the required forces necessary to defeat an invader, or to maintain the borders of Nehekara. And so, the mortuary cults entered into their final form, at least so far. They became the eternal watchers of both Nehekara, of the city-states, of the kings, the princes, and their troops. No longer were they intending to wake them back to a golden paradise, for pretty much all hope of that had long since vanished, although there are still those who make the effort, at least, to make good on their promises. But by and large, they all understand that they are no longer in possession of the resources or the capabilities to fulfill that ever more unlikely vow. Instead, they now simply raise whoever they are told to raise by Cetra. They raise as many soldiers as he wants, they re-embalm as many as he wants, they create as many constructs as he wants, and... As I'm sure you're starting to see the pattern here, simply do whatever is the will of Cetra the Imperishable, who now has Nehekara in as much of an iron grip now as he once did those many, many millennia ago. The final lesson then appears to be, for Cetra sitting upon his throne, ruling over a mostly empty kingdom, that you can't cheat death. And even if you should somehow be able to, then death will make damn sure that you wish you had never attempted to do so in the first place. Until next time, I've been Arch, thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Until then, have a good day.